Good morning, church family and ministry friends. I'm Pastor Stephen Brooks. Welcome today to our online, internet, around the world uh, church service. And I'm so glad that you're here today. Praise God. Why don't you take your Bibles and meet me in a very interesting scripture. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 23. Before we jump into today's message, let's first honor God with our finances. We're going to receive the tithes and offerings, and we want to look today at Proverbs chapter 27, verse 23. And here we are instructed, be diligent to know the state of your flocks. I like the word diligent. This is something that requires an ongoing checking. You have to give it oversight. You can't just let it run on remote control or, or auto. You have to keep an eye on it. Be diligent to know what? The state of your flocks and attend to your herds. So your flocks, your herds, those things that belong to you that are your oversight. And in this case, your flocks and herds have a lot to do with your financial livelihood. Not only how you can eat and have meat and butter and cheese, et cetera, and milk, all those good things. But of course, these can be bought and sold and increased and so forth. And we need to know the state of our flocks. Uh, what is their health condition? And exactly how many do we have? How many goats do we have? How many sheep do we have? Let's count them all up because, you know, they can, they can multiply. They can grow. Praise the Lord. And we, know, we need to know with diligence the state of our flocks. Now, here's something very interesting. Each year, you make a certain amount of money. And then going into the new year, you file your taxes and you get your tax return. And there's one line that shows you exactly how much money you made in the previous year. So you could look at that line that shows you what you made. And what you need to do is know this. You need to know the, the state of your flocks. And that one line will tell you exactly your gross income for the previous year. Let's say for the sake of uh, simplicity that you made $100,000. Well, what is the tithe off of $100,000? It's $10,000. So here's the thing. Sometimes we may think we're tithing, but perhaps we're not because we're not taking diligence to know the state of our flocks. In other words, you can look at that tax return. Let's say you made $100,000. There should be a $10,000 tithe that you can track to see that that went out. And sometimes we might, again, we might think, well, we're tithing, but then when we actually look at the flocks, we may realize that actually we're not. So we need to know with certainty if we are tithing and the tithe means 10%. By the way, uh, tithe, T I T H E is an English word. And our English word comes from the middle English back from the middle ages. And that's where our word tithe comes from. And it basically in our English language means 10%. Now we know tithing in the old Testament, that's going to be a Hebrew word tithing mentioned multiple times in the new Testament. That's going to be in the Greek. So in our English language, the tithe simply means 10%, but in Hebrew and in Greek, it not only means, now listen, this is very important. It not only means 10%, but in the Hebrew language and also in the Greek language, it implies that the 10% is up front. That, that's extremely important because not only does God say that the tithe is his, but we are to give it to him first. And this is where a lot of Christians make mistakes. They pay all these other bills. They pay the light light bill. Uh, they, you know, they pay the water bill, the sewer bill. Maybe those are rolled in the one the, based on your living situation, but they make all these other payments. And then if there's something left over, they give it to God. That is a mistake. The tithe goes first. Anytime increase hits your hand, whether that increases your paycheck or you just got a family inheritance or you got a bonus or just somebody 
walked up to you and gave you a hundred dollar bill. The first thing you do is you give the Lord the tithe. Praise God. And that my friends is good old B I B L E. That's the Bible. That's what the, that's what the Bible teaches. Now I want to share something interesting uh, concerning uh, being aware of the state of your flocks is that something I've realized with God is that he's extremely good with numbers. He's really good at accounting. Now we do know in the Bible, there's actually a book called numbers. <laughs> so yes, he's very, very good at numbers. He's good at accounting and you want that because when you go to heaven, uh, you want your uh, rewards, the things that you poured your heart into, which is God and his kingdom interest. You want God to be accurate, right? Well, God is, he's more accurate than what we know. This is very, very important. I want to show you another scripture that brings out why we need to know the state of our flocks and make sure that we're actually tithing. Praise God. Because the tithe is 10%. It's not eight and it's not nine. And God is very good at numbers. It must meet the requirement of 10%. Deuteronomy chapter eight. You all know this scripture. We've talked about it many times, but watch this. Deuteronomy eight verse 18 and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. Remember, it takes empowerment to get wealth. You don't need any power to be poor. <laughs> you, need, you need no covenant help from God to be a poor person. But to go uphill to acquire wealth takes power. So it is God that gives the power to get wealth. And there's a purpose. That he may establish his covenant, which you swore to your fathers as it is this day. This scripture unveils to us that God's wealth plan or financial blessing plan for his people works on the platform of a covenant. This is very important. And what is a covenant? A covenant is a deal. It's, it's an agreement between two people, sometimes two parties. Okay. But usually we're talking in this condition, we're talking about two people and that, that the people are you and God. So a covenant is a deal between two individuals and it's based on, on well-defined terms. And when those terms and conditions are met, then both parties, both people are now obligated to the terms of that covenant. Here's the thing. The financial covenant that God has with you is based on the tithe and sowing and reaping or giving and receiving. That's what activates the financial covenant. And God, God says that the tithe has to be 10%. So here's, here's why you need to know the state of your flocks. If you're, if you're, if, if you're giving a 7%, that's not a tithe. What does that basically mean? It means you have no financial covenant with God. Let that soak in. I'm not talking about a covenant of salvation. You're born again. Your sins are washed away. You're on your way to heaven. I'm talking about your finances. It is the tithe and a giving heart that connects you with the financial covenant where God releases power to get wealth, where God rebukes the devourer and God opens the windows of heaven over your life with blessing. And it doesn't happen at 7%. It doesn't happen at 9.2%. It only happens at 10%. And he's really, really good with numbers. And if you're not giving 10%, you're not a tither. I'll go further. If you're not giving the tithe first, you're not a tither. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about tithing, what are we actually talking about? We're talking about practicing the covenant. We're not talking about playing games. We're talking about meeting terms and conditions because every covenant has terms and conditions. Every contract has the fine print. And when you read the fine print and obey it, now the covenant comes into action. So, so God will not commit himself to you with financial covenant. If you're not at 10%, pastor Stephen, I looked at the numbers and um, I'm at eight. Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, but that's not 10. So if you want God to commit himself to what he said he would do, then you have to meet your, your part. You have to do your part. <laughs> and sometimes you don't even know that until you actually look. How much money did I actually make? How many flocks 
of goats and sheep or camels or whatever it might be. How much do I actually have? Look at the numbers and make sure that you're tithing off that. The numbers don't lie. I like math. <laughs> it's not my specialty, but I really do like math a lot because the, the math is right. The math is right. The numbers are what they are. They reflect the truth. So let us line up with God uh, is requiring of us. Praise God. Well, Pastor Stephen, what happens if I tithe and then I, and then I stop? You have breached the terms of the covenant and the deal's off. Mm. Praise God. Amen. So my friends, let's get into the blessing. Let's walk in the blessing and let's be obedient to the Lord. Have you ever noticed the technicalities of Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse one? Look at it just for a moment. Then I'm going to pray for you. Deuteronomy 28 verse 1. Now watch this very carefully. Now it shall come to pass if all of God's blessings are conditional, if, and, and, and conditions are your obedience. Okay. Now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey, not just casually like walk into this thing like, oh, well, I guess it's going to just all, no, 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 diligence. You have to diligently obey the voice of the Lord, your God to observe carefully, observe carefully, observe carefully. What does that mean? It means read the fine print. It means find out what he is requiring of you and I, and then do it. Find out and execute, but you can't execute what you don't know. Wow. Praise God. None of these, none of these areas of blessing, none of these areas of, of God's goodness, none of this stuff is just like stumbled into randomly. None of this is just like, oh, he's just lucky or she, oh, she just, she, uh, she had a very fortunate, uh, event happen to her. That's just chance. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's God's blessing working. It's the covenant in action. Praise God. But it requires diligence to obey. And also that we observe carefully observe, meditate on it, think about on it. And, and re you, you, this is what happens when you get older. You realize that God meant exactly what he said. And when God says you do this, you'll live. In other words, things go well with you. He meant it. And if you don't do it, uh, it's not going to go good. It's not going to go good. Well, I, I'm just going to do my own thing. Anyhow, pastor Stephen, well, you're going to you're going to have some tough places, some tough places. Mm -mm. You know, some, some Christians will argue about tithing. They don't want to do it. They'll argue for why they think they shouldn't do it as listen to this as if there's something dirty and filthy about God's commandments, as if there's something horrible and awful about God's system or God's method. So they're going to go try to go out and reinvent the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Can you imagine them standing before God on their day of judgment, trying to, trying to explain why, why they were so rebellious against something that is so pure, simple, and holy, as if there's something dirty about God's holy commandments. Wow. I love them. I love them. David said, they are my delight all the day. I take, I am thrilled when my wife and I bring the tithe to God, I'm thrilled in my heart because I'm placing that tithe into the hands of Jesus Christ, my high priest, whoever lives to make intercession for me. Praise God. When you tithe, when you bring the 10% the first into the storehouse, that's the place where you're taught, where you're spiritually nourished and fed. You are, you are in a sense, placing that tithe into the hands of your savior, Jesus Christ. He's still receiving the tithe today. Praise God. So my friends, verse, verse one of chapter 28, read the fine print, know the state of your flocks and 7% is not 10%. He doesn't engage in covenant until you meet the terms and conditions. That's the tithe, which is 10% presented up front. It's dishonorable to put God last, put God First, praise God. And I'm telling you, there's power in the covenant. There's power in the covenant. Your life, your finances, your whole world is built on the rock of God's word. Storms may come, but you're not shaken. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 
Father, I thank you that as your people bring the tithes and the offerings into the storehouse of God, I thank you that they are children of light. They know the difference between 10% and four. They know the difference. They're good at math. I praise you, O oh God, that they are covenant practitioners walking, walking in righteousness and heavenly illumination. I thank you that they are literally your ambassadors in the earth. Father, we give you praise. Bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you that prefer to mail in your tithes and offerings, you can send them to Stephen Brooks International, P.O. Box 717, Moravian Falls, North Carolina, our zip code 28654. And as an extra bonus, our administrator walks to the post office every day. It is literally about, about 40 yards from here. It's a very busy post office. <laughs> Small area, but a very busy beehive of a post office. Praise God. Amen. Now, if you prefer to mail, excuse me, not to mail in, but to bring your tithes and offerings in online electronically, which is very simple. It's also very fast. And plus, you can do it from anywhere in the world, anytime, day or night. You can do so by visiting the website of our ministry, stephenbrooks.org. There's a link on the homepage that says give. It has a red heart. Click that. You can bring the tithe right into the storehouse of God. If you would like to sow, seed or give an offering towards any of the projects that we're currently focused on. You can click that orange banner that says projects. And so as the Holy spirit leads you and as the joy in your heart directs you, praise God. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we understand that you are a covenant keeping God. So we thank you, father God, that we are walking in truth and righteousness with you in Jesus name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, my friends, let's go back to the book of Proverbs today. I want to talk about the earthly and eternal rewards of righteousness. So let's begin today in Proverbs chapter 14, Proverbs 14, and let's pray concerning today's message. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would come pouring forth light and understanding into the eyes of our heart so that we can actually take your word and apply it because we can understand it. Now we thank you father for your word producing a hundredfold fruit of blessing and goodness in our lives. We thank you in Jesus name. And we all say, amen. Amen. Proverbs chapter 14. Let's begin today in verse 34. Praise God. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. I actually saw this verse ingrained. Well, I shouldn't say ingrained, uh, carved into granite above an administrative building on a, uh, on the campus of a very, very secular university. <laughs> I was walking the class one day and I had to almost do a double take. I'm like, wow, I can't believe they've got that up there. Well, that's because they put it up there over a hundred years ago. Uh, things have changed of course, since then, uh, in people's behaviors and ideologies, but the word of God doesn't change. And that's actually what it said. It, it was a quote, direct quote from here. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. My friends, it's very important as believers that we understand that righteousness never demotes, but it exalts. Praise God. There can be some temporary setbacks because of your righteous stance, but what may appear to others to be as you missing a golden opportunity because of your stance for righteousness is really only a test. And your great promotion is actually on, a, on the way from a different angle. Praise God. So righteousness does not demote. It actually exalts. Now, it says that sin is a reproach. What does the word reproach actually mean? It means to bring upon yourself disgrace, discredit, blame, shame, and disapproval. So if you strive to live a holy and a righteous life, then everywhere you turn, you will find God's presence, God's goodness, and his 
blessings. Praise God. My friends, sin brings a curse, but righteousness ushers the blessings of God into your life. Praise God. Let's go to Psalm 112, and we'll see this in verses 1 through 3. Verse 1 says, Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. His descendants will be mighty on earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house. And his righteousness endures for how long? Forever. Woo! Praise God. That's a long, long time. Amen. Righteousness is often in place wherever you see the blessings of God being manifested. However, the wages of sin and wages is your payday or your paycheck. The wages of sin is death, but the wages of righteousness is life more abundant. Oh, oh, generational blessings, wealth and riches in your house and your right standing with God, your righteousness in him. It's something that goes on throughout eternity. Praise God. Glory to God. There is a lot more pleasure in righteousness than there is in sin. Oh, I want to nail that down today. I'm, I'm sure that statement made a few Christians a little bit squirmy that actually question, could such a statement be true? I want to say it again. There is a lot more pleasure, not just a little more. There is a lot more pleasure in righteousness than there is in sin. Even the temporary pleasures of Egypt, as Moses said no to, we know they're temporary, but we would admit, yes, they're pleasurable, but, but righteousness is even more pleasurable. Mm -mm. There is a lot more pleasure in righteousness than there is in sin. These pleasures include prosperity, promotion, honor, and many, many other blessings. Let's go now to Psalm 92. Psalm 92, praise God. I actually used to have uh, Psalm 92 as my license plate. Psalm 9210 used to be my license plate. I changed it since then because uh, sometimes you find another verse, you get all excited about that. Praise God. But let's go over to Psalm 92 and actually begin in verse 10. But my horn or my, my empowerment, you have exalted like a wild ox. I have been anointed with fresh oil. My eye also has seen my desire on my enemies, my ears, hear my desire on the wicked who rise up against me. Now verse 12, the righteous, the righteous, not the, not the dirty old sinner, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He, that would be ladies also, shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Listen to this. This pertains to you, the righteousness, those, of, the, those that love the Lord. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. That's you right there. That's what righteousness produces. Verse 15, to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. I would present to you that because there's no unrighteousness in Jesus, there should be found no unrighteousness in us either. Praise God. My friends, no matter what type of difficulties sweep across the earth, whether it's economic drought or various disruptions that come on the face of the earth, I'm here today to say with the scripture as my backing that the righteous shall flourish. Praise God. Everyone that practices righteousness shall flourish. That is the heritage of the saints of God. Praise the Lord. Let's take a look for a moment at the life of Job. Job chapter 1 and verse 1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned or stayed away from evil. 
and seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep. See, righteousness promotes. It doesn't strip you. It empowers you for blessing. His possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. My friends, righteousness was the reason for the height that Job obtained. He had the largest luxury vehicle dealership in the entire Middle Eastern part of the world. Ooh, he had lots of camels. That was the desert Mercedes Benz of the day. And the reason that he had such height was because of his righteousness, his clean living, his clean walk with God. Today, my friends, let sin die. Let it die in your life so that the glory that God has mapped out for you will begin to come forth in a very, very beautiful and fragrant way. Praise God. Job became the greatest man in the land, not through some means of crookedness or, or perverse dealings going on behind the curtain, but no, he became that great man because of righteousness. Praise the Lord. <laughs> righteousness, it holds a guarantee even for your prosperity mm -mm. and for your freedom and your liberty. Even the prodigal son knew this. Let's go to Luke chapter 15 just for a moment. We're turning over now to Luke chapter 15. Luke 15. Let's go down to verse 20. Well, verse 18 is good also. Look at this. He said, I will arise. In other words, he says, he's basically saying, I'm done with living in sin, playing around with sin, being a, re a rebel against the ways of God. He said, I'm done. He said, I will arise. That's, that's the change right there. I will arise and go to my father. And verse 20, and he arose and came to his father. See, he did it. He did it. And all the minions of the evil one couldn't stop him from doing it. You still have your will. God gave you free moral will to choose who you will serve and to choose how you will live and govern your life. Today, say no to sin. Say yes to righteousness. Praise God. He walked out of the pig pen and walked where? Back into freedom and liberty. And that freedom and liberty was based upon his repentance and choosing to live a life of righteousness. Praise God. Hallelujah. He walked into liberty. Yes. And even, even honor. See, sin strips. It strips honor away from your life. It is designed by the evil one to leave you in a state of being a pauper, of being someone that perhaps once had a name that once had dignity and honor, and it wants to take all of that from you and steal it from you and put you down to a place where you just look like a silly slice of bread. That is now the value, the level of esteem that people have for you. They've lost all respect for you because of your engagement and practice of sin. But my friends, when we turn to the Lord in righteousness, even honor is bestowed upon those that are willing to live right. Even if they've previously blown it, come back to the Lord and the Lord will restore you and honor begins to flow. Why? This is so important because honor has its root in righteousness. Mm -mm. Honor actually has its root in righteousness. Here is a tremendous promise for you today found in Daniel chapter 12. I want this message to go into your heart, but if there were only one scripture that you could walk away from today, from this message, and, and the scripture is just like carved and engraved into you, let it be Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And listen, and those who turn many to righteousness, like the stars forever. And ever, I am here today to proclaim that righteousness establishes you before God, not only with the legacy on the earth, but forever and ever and ever. What are you doing playing with sin? 
Praise God. Those who turn many to righteousness. You have those out there that are the devil's evangelist, and they're trying to turn people to sin. And they delight in those who sin and do the wicked things that they do. And they, in, they encourage them to even go further than what they have done. But my friends, we are those who are wise because we are directing people into the righteousness, the walk with God that is pleasing to him. And those who turn many to righteousness, you're going to shine like a star forever and forever. Glory to God. God, hallelujah, 10 million years from now, you will be so glad that there came that day in your life. You said, I will arise and say goodbye to the pig pen and go to my father and start living right. Praise God. And he got up and went. The day that you got up and went will be memorable for all eternity. That's the moment your star began to be illuminated. Mm, 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 mm. Praise God. Righteousness causes men and women to shine as stars. If you truly, now listen today, if you truly desire honor, then wisdom demands, it demands that you also desire righteousness. Mm, wow. Whoa. The anointed servant of God, the man of God that laid hands on my head, and said, Stephen, you need wisdom. And he was flowing in a very high level of wisdom. He laid hands on me and prayed for me. And wisdom from God came into me. My ministry hasn't been the same since. But he did not embrace righteousness. Where is he at today? In prison. Sitting in prison right now as I talk to you. Because he loved wisdom. But he did not embrace righteousness. If you don't go after righteousness and clean living, the enemy will set a snare for you and you'll fall into it because you have refused righteousness. Watch out. We are living in the last days. The traps of the enemy are supernaturally, diabolically camouflaged and, and put out there. Hmm. And you're walking in the flesh, you'll walk right into it. The only way you can divert them is walk in the spirit. That includes wisdom and righteousness. Lift your hands today and say, I'm all in. <laughs> Woo, praise God. Mm -mm. Again, if you truly desire honor, then wisdom demands that you also desire righteousness. When righteousness is in place, then honor, it just automatically flows into your life. Again, today I want to reiterate, you don't need to be crooked to become great. Don't you ever take a bribe and don't ever give one either. Don't ever offer one. Don't ever go to a county official and say, Hey, we, we can't, can't we get this done a little bit faster and you know, shove him $200. Don't ever ever do such abominable practices. If you ever take a bribe or give one, you have lost all discernment for justice. A spirit comes upon you and your vision is now impaired. Everything in life becomes muddied with your decision making from that moment forward. Mm -mm. You don't need to be crooked to become great. You don't need to sell yourself to be given a throne. What is a throne? A lofty position. You can have a lofty position without compromising, but any throne that unrighteousness creates or places on you is only to bring you shame and humiliation at the end. Mm -mm. Stand your ground in the truth of God's word. It is not your setback. It is actually your way up. Praise God. Cause God's up. God's up. And he'll never be, he'll never come down. Why is he up? Because he's righteous. He's righteous <laughs> and no unrighteous person can ever pull him down. Do you see the strength of righteousness? Mm -mm. Every accomplishment of the kingdom is born of a desire. God places those desires within us through prayer and meditation on the word. We begin to identify with those ingrained prophetic 
destiny desires. And since honor is a, <coughs> excuse me, since honor is a branch that comes off of the tree of righteousness, then we are to desire. You need to actually desire righteousness. Praise God. This will greatly aid in the accomplishment of those desires that you have, those things that you want to do within God's beautiful and glorious kingdom. Praise the Lord. Now, there is another angle of this message that I need to share with you today concerning righteousness and the beauty of it. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. I would be amiss if I didn't share this angle with you. I would not be fully preparing you if I did not also share these scriptures to give you a fuller understanding of the righteousness package. Praise God. Second Timothy chapter three, verse 12. Yes. And all please take your highlighter, take your pen and underline the word all. By the way, if you have a Bible that's not marked up, that has never been written in, you need to, you need to, you need to somehow dissolve that today completely. <laughs> you need to get a pen. I've got highlighters. I've got all kinds of color highlighters because each for me, each color represents something different. And you need to, you need to let your Bible look like a workbook. I, I see some people, these pristine, perfect looking Bibles. It looks like they've never been used. Well, the reason they look like that is because for the most part, they haven't. Hallelujah. Let your Bible be used and, and, and take your, take your highlighters and take your, the, your, your tools and begin to go to work in there. Like this is something that you're actually studying for real. Hallelujah. If you did all of, if you had your highlighters and all this stuff for, for exams that you took in school or for educational purposes to, to pass an exam or test, why wouldn't you do it for the most important thing? More important than anything else, praise God. Underline the word all. Yes, and all who desire, I know that's you, who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will. Not, uh, not well, maybe they, they will or might not. No, you're going to. Will suffer persecution. Don't get nervous. Hang with me today. I want to read it again. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Today, on the tail end of this message, I want to say that you need to develop yourself to actually enjoy persecutions because they're going to come. But here's the thing. Make sure that there's no truth to those persecutions because you're going to be persecuted. That's okay. <laughs> but make sure there's no truth of the persecutions. In other words, if they are saying, oh, that person's just a liar, make sure you're telling the truth. If, if they say, oh, that person's really a thief, make sure you're not stealing. But outside of that, hold to your strong stance on the Word of God. That's why the persecution is coming, because of your holding to these biblical principles. But understand that it will come. It will come. I get it in various ways. I get all kinds of comments on the internet, comments uh, on emails. I get people that drive by literally that know I'm preaching and they drive by, rev up their motorcycle or honk the horn or do anything they can to try to cause a disturbance. I get, I get all kinds of stuff from all over the place. But you know what? I just keep right on going. I know that's part of the package. <laughs> Amen. Persecutions are actually signals and proofs of your promotion by the Lord. I want to tell you this and be very candid with you today. Here's what I want to say. God is out to stir up jealousy through you. Mm -mm -mm. Let that percolate down into your spiritual marrow of your bones. God is out to stir up jealousy through you. Mm -mm. He wants to show off through you. He wants to reveal himself do you, through you. He wants to do exploits through you. And it will provoke a jealousy in a sense where people are like, oh, how is he or she doing that? And you know, that creates various responses. And often these responses can be of a uh, type of persecution. So if you choose to live the holy life, if you choose to walk in righteousness, you will, 
you will absolutely be persecuted. It's okay. It's okay. What is persecution? It is a display of emotional displeasure, which leads to unjust treatment. It is born often out of jealousy, hatred, and bitterness. But persecution is the heritage of those who are always on the front lines for God. Always. There is no way you can stand on the front line for the Lord and not receive persecution. It is the heritage of frontliners. Don't back off just because somebody's talking about you. Praise the Lord. The hundredfold return comes with hundredfold persecutions. Mm -mm -mm. If you can't accept persecution, then what you're also saying is that you can't accept being blessed. It's just too much. It's too much for some. Maybe they don't want to have anybody say anything to them. Maybe they want everybody to celebrate them all the time. If that's the case, something is horribly, horribly wrong with your life. Jesus addressed that very issue. Luke chapter six, verse 26. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. <laughs> Listen to it. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. If that's the case, everybody's speaking well of you. Something is terribly, horribly wrong. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. Mm, 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 mm. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Mm, mm. Thank you, Jesus. The hundredfold return comes with hundredfold persecutions. If you can't accept persecution, then you really, you don't want to be blessed. But my friends in a race, only those who are in the back are able to see who's up running at the front. If you don't want to be talked about against those that are in the back, then what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to abandon your front leading position and go back in the back with the other losers that are grumbling, complaining and mumbling and who actually in reality, they're not happy even with their own lives. Mm. Look, you have to let the persecutors do what they do. That's what they do. <laughs> Maybe that's their ministry. <laughs> Just let them talk. Mm. You must allow those who are behind you to do their job and they're back there. And when I say when they're back there, that's literally where they're at. They're in the back and they're backbiting the back of the ones that are in the front. That's because they're in the back. That's what they do. They can't get you to the front because they're going to backbite, but they gossip and they slander and they lie. And they sometimes can just be very, very creative in the lies of the things that they say. And again, with persecution, it will come, but just make sure there's no truth or validity to what they're saying. Live a life of righteousness. Praise God. Mm -mm. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You know, those who are always interested in only pleasing other men will realize that you can't, you can't serve God when your life is structured that way. So you need to develop yourself to actually enjoy persecutions. Why? That's a sign of God's promoting and lifting up of your life, of your purpose, and of your assignment. Praise the Lord. My friends, your persecutors, leave them to their opinions. Don't, don't argue with them. And don't let it make you bitter. Don't let it make you bitter. But just go on. And stay happy in your heart and stay focused on your assignment. There is no position, even within the kingdom, there is no position from which you can lead and please everybody. There is no position from which you can lead and not have people that are out there that are going to write things that are inaccurate or that are, that are cruel or that are nasty. 
Okay, those things are going to happen. But in the kingdom of God, as we serve the Lord, you'll have those sometimes not only from outside, but also from within the church itself that can bring persecution, perhaps through misunderstanding. Really locally, any, any persecution that I get locally, there's a lot of people locally that love me, but there's also those locally that don't understand me. Their misunderstanding of God, and I'm talking about Christians, their misunderstanding of God, their misunderstanding of Scripture causes them to misunderstand me. And so what do we do often with things we can't understand? Those that are not walking in the light, they persecute that which they don't understand. But you know what? When we go on with a joyful heart and we forgive them, even as Stephen, when he was being stoned, said, Father, please don't hold this sin against them. When we go on and walk in love and keep our joy, you'll find that sometimes down the road, there can even be former persecutors that have now seen the light, now walk in truth, and now become a staunch, unrelenting ally to your cause and to your purpose. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So my friends, righteousness is going to lift you. Righteousness causes honor automatically to begin to flow into your life and good things, beautiful things start happening. And of course the devil doesn't like that. Yes, there will be persecution again. Yes. And all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. If you want to live like the devil and you want to uh, try to please people, then the world in many ways will even celebrate you. But when you want to live godly in Christ Jesus, you will suffer persecution. You may even suffer what can look like a temporary setback because you were passed by or you were denied because of your beliefs or your principles. But my friends, don't ever mistake righteousness for being something that pulls you down. It's actually a sign of your promotion. Righteousness always lifts. The persecution that you're getting because of your righteous stance is a sign from heaven of your lifting up and promotion. So stay strong. I'm so glad that Daniel didn't eat the king's food. He would have defiled himself. Why? None of the food was kosher. And God said that uh, through the laws of Moses, that these are the foods you can eat. These are the foods you can't eat. Everything on the king's table was all uh, no go. It was all food that was non kosher. You had every, you had um, pork sausage. You had uh, crawdads. You had shrimp. You had all the the shellfish. You had all kinds of. The king had it all and said, he said, uh, you, you Jews eat up. I want you to be full. And Daniel and his, and his men said, no, um, we can't eat that. <laughs> uh, not, not so much because of health reasons. And then remember, even for health, you don't want to eat the creepy crawlers on the bottom. You want to eat from the top of the food chain that God says is the clean. Okay, there's health benefits associated with that. We also know there was tremendous symbolism associated with that concerning clean, unclean, etc. We, ex we understand a lot more of that concerning the New Covenant theology. But my friends, even so, Daniel said, I can't eat that if I do that. That's against God's law. He was willing to take a stand, even no matter what it meant, no matter what it, what it meant. Oh, Pastor Stephen, if he does that, he's going to lose his position. He's going to lose everything. No, no, no. Righteousness dictates certain standards of living. These are biblical morals and values as represented by Jesus Christ, his word, and as conveyed through his holy church. So it's not, it's not that this is going to put you down. No, this is actually your means of lifting. This is your means of lifting. And it was, it was, it looked like a setback, but no, it was his means of lifting. And it also caused honor to flow to him. Righteousness never degrades. Righteousness lifts. Sin degrades and sinks people's boats and destroys their lives. Righteousness positions you for earthly blessing and eternal blessing in Christ. Lift your hands. Father, I pray for everyone watching today that they choose righteousness. Father, I know that many have chosen Christ as their Lord and Savior, but they have thought perhaps that their, their standards of biblical living could be a liability. No, it's not a liability. It's an asset. 
And I pray that that mindset be changed to a, a biblical way of thinking from this day forward. Father, we give you praise. We thank you in Jesus' name for establishing us in righteousness and right living before you in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Praise God. For those that are watch, watching today's message and you've never made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, today is your day to come out of sin and to come into righteousness. And you can receive Christ through this simple prayer. Pray it now. Pray it after me. Pray it out loud. Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, but I repent. Come into my heart. Wash my sins away. Jesus, give me your new life. Write my name in your book of life. And Jesus, from this day forward, step into my life and lead me and guide me in all that I do. In your name I pray. Thank you for saving me. Amen. Praise God. And may I be the first to say welcome. Welcome to the family of God. Hallelujah. Glory. Glory to God. Boy, we're going to have a good time in heaven. Mm -mm. <laughs> and until we get them, we're going to have a good time down here. Amen. Now, everybody that would like to, let's take Holy Communion together. Grab some grape juice and a little cracker, a little wafer. I use these portable ones because they're so convenient. And you can buy these online. Uh, you can go to Amazon or anywhere you want. You can order these. I order uh, Kelly orders like 200 at a time and we keep them in the refrigerator, but they're sealed. So they don't really even need to go in the refrigerator, but makes them last a little bit longer, but grab some grape juice and a cracker. Let's take Holy communion together. If you are a Christian, you can receive Holy communion. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the juice, the bread. We bless it and we consecrate it. That is, we set it apart as holy through this prayer. And we thank you that this is now the flesh and the blood of Jesus. And Father, as we receive his flesh, we thank you for the strength of righteousness in our lives. Father, we say we, we choose Jesus. We choose righteousness because we know it's the way up. We know it's the way up and sin is the way down. And Father, we're going up. We choose to go up with you. So Father, as we receive the Lord's flesh, we receive righteousness in Him, through Him, and union with Him. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's receive the Lord's body. Praise God. Praise God. Mm, 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 mm. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the blood, the blood, the blood of Jesus, cleansing us from all sin, keeping us safe from all harm. We thank you, Father God, that we are covered with the blood of Jesus. And Father, we forgive anyone who has sinned against us, who has spoken against us or lied about us or whatever the case might be. We forgive them and we bless them and we go on, oh God, in the joy of the Lord. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Father God, for the protection of the blood of Jesus. Oh God, we give you praise. We thank you for righteousness established in our lives. Thank you, Father God, for Christ and his strength being formed in us. We receive the blood of Christ, your son, now. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's drink together. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. My friends, thank you for watching today. I look forward to seeing you back next time. Continue to walk in righteousness and watch honor flow into your life and watch the climb, the trajectory that God continues to take you higher and higher for his glory. I see you shining as a star forever and ever. God bless you. Bye-bye.